Hey guys, I'm Gaspachian. You've seen me stuck on Kerbin, it's only going to get worse from here. I'll make a promise right away. Not all of our rocket launches are going to be made quite such a big deal out of as this one. But we want to celebrate in style that a new chapter of space exploration has commenced. Yes indeed, for it was a long time ago we last pointed our gaze at the stars. Since space exploration was lacking for much of the previous chapter, we have to make up for this in kind in the second chapter of our continuing odyssey. And in this first mission, we're going to make it count by really pushing the envelope for what is possible with our current technology. Those who paid attention during the last episode saw me pick up a contract for a month flyby with no expiry. Those paying attention now will notice that in preparation for this mission we're packing quite a lot of recoverable science. This is because we are already being mindful of ablation cascades and Kessler syndrome, even though we at the moment have but one single broken satellite in orbit. We are vowing to leave as little debris as possible in our wake as we quest for the stars. That, and the heaps of science that a return mission promises, is what makes us target a free return trajectory for our moon bound science probe. Getting any regular old encounter with the moon is of course no harder in 64k than in stock KSP, delta V costs aside. Of course, we're also dealing with the inclination from the harder solar system config as well, but assuming our launch went well, that's nothing we have to worry about at this stage either. The trick here is instead to plot for a trajectory that will carry us as close to the surface of the moon as we dare, to maximize science returns while keeping the resulting Kerbin periapse after our encounter within the atmosphere. To further add to the art, we have to make sure the maneuver takes place while we have a connection to the KSC, which is very touch and go without a comms network in place. So now you may be asking, how do you plot a free return encounter with the moon? I wish I could relay a more foolproof method, but the truth is, the way I know how is more through experience than knowledge. You want to be coming in to the moon's sphere of influence going retrograde, and you want to be moving fast enough to be flung out at just the right angle as to not add any of the moon's orbital velocity to your own, but the exact angles and speeds are unknown to me. If done correctly, the patched conics will tell you so. Which is to say I'd never attempt maneuvers such as this without an upgraded tracking station. As we saw, I managed to get an encounter with the desired orbital characteristics. I then realized that at the time of the burn, the probe would be out of comms range, so we had to replot the whole maneuver. This episode takes place before we have unlocked either RCS thrusters or reaction wheels, so some trickery is going to be needed to align ourselves with our maneuver node. We do have solid rocket boosters, and this is going to be their finest hour. On board this craft there are in fact three SRBs angled to give the most primitive of attitude control to our craft. In total, this gives us the ability to properly angle ourselves for up to three burns after our initial orbital ascent. With a perfectly executed free return trajectory, we'd only have to do one, but we bring spares in case we don't quite nail the maneuver. Also, I didn't bring a chart telling me which booster spins the craft in which direction, so if we by accident engage a booster that spins us on an axis that will never align us with the maneuver node, we've got a contingency plan for that too. With all the pieces in place, it is time to perform this delicate dance to bring our first probe out to the moon in this Kerbal timeline. For this to work, we first need to align the probe with the node, then complete the burn before we lose the connection to the KSC below. The burn is going to cost about 2300 meters per second, which means that with our initial TWR of about 1, this will be a 3 minute burn. This burn magnitude is about what you'd expect for a well plotted ELO encounter in the stock game. With time margins so tight, the decision is made to perform the burn ahead of schedule at the cost of both efficiency and accuracy. Because when you think about it, how fun would it really be if our first real orbital maneuver of this playthrough went without a hitch? 
The dangers of losing connection to the probe mid-burn would be mild as long as we didn't get an encounter. This is not realism overhaul, we don't have to worry about limited engine ignitions or the like. However, if we were to get an encounter other than the one we plotted for, there's no telling where our probe would end up, crashed into the MUN or Kerbin, or possibly even flung out of the system. Rather than taking these risks by performing the burn on time, it's judged that the cost of correctional burns after an imprecise translunar injection burn is a price worth paying. In hindsight, using the flight computer of remote tech would probably have been a more valid solution to our issues at hand, but that's not what happened as you can see. Other than this, this is a bog standard translunar injection perhaps one of the first things one would learn after getting into orbit, only made different by our stringent requirements for a free return and the burn magnitude. But, with the deviations made from the plotted flight plan, it would seem the encounter we get is not initially a free return trajectory. As such, those correctional burns for which we brought multiple reaction control SRBs will have to be plotted for. Again, these future correctional burns will have to be conducted with direct line of sight to the KSC, ideally when the probe is in daylight so it does not run out of juice mid-burn. This prevents us from performing a more efficient correction than the one we are plotting for now, earlier on. If plotting for a radial deflection as we are now, the earlier you are able to do it, the more bang for your delta V you'll get. However, the KSC will be out of line of sight for much of the lunar transfer, so our burn will have to wait. At this point, this is nothing we worry about, since the correction is only expected to cost about half of our remaining delta V. Already, the probe has flown higher, faster and further than any craft in history, but the mission engineers are not calling it a success until it's safely back on the ground for further studies. The contract may say we're only required to do a close month flyby, but here we go all the way and back if we can. At least if we feel like we're up to it on that particular day. As we can see, the plotted maneuver has to be delayed even further than we initially expected, since we're still waiting for the KSE to come into line of sight. In 64k, the Kerbin day is increased from the standard 6 hours of the base game to a more familiar 24 hours, all in the name of more challenge. This means lower added velocities on launch from the planet's rotation, higher geosynchronous orbits, and in our case a longer wait for connections to be re-established. But finally, the friendly radio dishes of the tracking station are able to pick up the, our probe after a 6 and a half hour long blackout which allows us to relay maneuver commands to it once again. So we fire the correctional thruster number 2 and prepare to execute the node, this time performing the burn at the advised time to avoid having to perform further corrections. Mid-course correctional burns are of course way less sensitive in this regard, but the probe is starting to run on fumes by this point and any margin we can spare is a margin we may well still need. After a successful correction that makes our rendezvous with Kerbin's atmosphere a certainty, we ponder the next challenge we must tackle. Because, just as what happened on historical mission to Earth's nearest neighbor, we are bound for radio darkness. Since we've also tasked ourselves with returning data from space just above the grey features of this first alien world we've encountered, we must devise a way to activate our experiments while out of comms range. As such, still lacking any more sophisticated way of automating tasks, we program the flight computer with the estimated delay until we are at our nearest to the MUN and hope that it will correctly fire the commands. Now, this turns out to be in vain for seemingly two reasons. The first is that we reach low space before our comms cut out, allowing us to grab that science early if we so wanted to. Secondly, due to science alert being installed, I believe we can bypass remote tech completely for our science experiments by interacting with them through that mod's UI instead. 
Since some may call this a bit cheaty, I'll try to restrain myself from doing that too much, even if that possibility exists. In any case, more for the demonstration than anything, we pick up our recoverable science from space near the moon while in radio darkness. While the science messages don't exactly scream scientific progress, the return values do, promising to allow us great strides in rocketry and related ventures in the near future. We pass our Perimon 33 kilometers above average sea level without thinking too closely how our agency has devised a standard for moon or altitude already, moving at about 2 kilometers per second. With higher frame rates, the encounter would probably have looked way more spectacular, but that's for another playthrough in another version of KSP. With our science near Mun successfully performed, we start our drift away from our newfound friend, remembering to also pick up science high above the Mun on our way out. In hindsight, I don't quite remember why the sciencing was put off until such a late stage. I think my excuse was along the lines of not knowing which experiments could be run in low space if I had already used up half of them beforehand. Which is not how it works, mind you, since you can clearly see if an experiment has been run or not. Anyways, we're here to get home safely, not to decipher what the intents of past me may have been. To get home safely, we again fire up the flight computer to prepare for re-entry. We program it to, prior to atmospheric contact, dump the transfer stage and arm our chutes for automatic altitude deployment. We couldn't dump the stage out by the SOI change, since the impulse of the decoupler may fling us any which way and lose our precious atmospheric re-entry window. We instead hold off until just before re-entry, where our contact is more inevitable. However, there is one small caveat with our trajectory, and I am the one to blame. Now, in stock KSP, you want to put your peri key at about 35 to 40 kilometers for a gentle aero break and landing on your first go when returning from the moon. In real solar system, you're rather looking at a perigee of about 70 kilometers, anything much lower than will lead to unwanted explosions. If unwanted explosions can even be considered a real thing. Since it's been a while since I last returned from the moon in 64k, I pretty much figured aiming for the midway point between those values would be perfect, and I overshot the right value by quite a bit it seems. But at this point, none of this really matters much. Our transfer stage is safely dumped and suborbital, our chutes are armed, and our probe will deorbit itself sooner or later. And I'd rather wait two or three orbits for this probe to make it home in one piece, than to in a single orbit tear the probe into many pieces. We do still make a note that lower perikeys are probably what we want for our future manned missions when life support will become an issue. On our first pass, we were pretty well aligned with the KSC and would probably have landed but a few hundred kilometers off our target had it not been for our miscalculations. Now we're finally coming in for a landing, we are regrettably in the dark and about as far away from our base as we could be. We'll get to daytime launches and landings in a while, but these nighttime ops are a necessity if doing missions this time of the year. Also, we should probably start fabricating our rockets out of the same material used for these solar panels, which miraculously survived the re-entry for reasons unknown. If we could study the reason for that in-game, I'm sure the science return from this mission would at least triple. But, as our scientists did expect, the probe returned with droves of data to keep them busy for at least minutes to come, even if that times 3 multiplier was left out. Most of it is spent right away, aiming to unlock docking nodes and even more massive rockets. These will be crucial for future manned flight to other worlds, it is said, and we dare not speak up and tell the madmen that they are getting ahead of themselves. Sending a probe on a flyby is one thing, landing a Kerbal on that body and then bringing that Kerbal back requires almost 5000 Delta V more. We're going to work ourselves up to that point in time, but for now we have to consider other tasks at hand to get there. We're letting them believe that we're headed out to Minmus next, but before that we have other business to attend to. Instead of obliging mission control, we commission new fancy buildings, a proper runway, and perform some off-screen survey contracts while we wait to unlock reaction control thrusters. The business we are to attend to is once again space business, which requires us to design another launcher. 
And there's a reason we put off this particular set of missions until we had access to RCS, but more on that later. For now, let's talk about the launcher. Of course, we opt to try a crazy design with a pure SRB first stage, believing this will cut our launch costs. However, this blooper reel clearly shows that maybe that wasn't the brightest of ideas, with both launch clamps, engines and my own piloting skills claiming several rockets in our simulations. Could the design have been made to work giving enough tweaking? Absolutely, but in the end it didn't stand up to the patience we already expended back in episode 3, where we already experienced all the bugs the SRBs were willing to throw at us. This of course mirrors real life, where solid rocket boosters have been the cause for several minor and a few major tragedies in the history of rocketry. For our final design, we go for something a bit more conservative, opting for a wide, liquid-fueled first stage, rather than a more daring SRB solution we looked into earlier, to carry our payload into LKO. Or rather, our six payloads, but I'm only showcasing four of those launches. Partly because that fits neatly on screen, also because the other two were just more of the same. By now, there's probably no secret that these payloads are comms relays. We have opted not to launch any such relays up until now, since we've been lacking RCS control to fine-tune the orbits of the satellites to be synchronized. We could probably put off launching any relay satellites for a while longer, but this rudimentary network will greatly improve the reliability of both our LKO operations as well as our transmunar activities. We deploy them in coplanar orbits with the MUN to allow for full uptime when performing our transfer burns to the MUN or pretty much any other body we're likely to visit in the near future for that matter. The need for six relays is due to the fact that they are put in such a low orbit, which would show some based on our launcher's capabilities. Usually, you'd put relays in higher orbits, giving them a wider line of sight, allowing you to get broader coverage with fewer satellites. Limited funds and technology make us instead go for the more primitive option, since getting a satellite up into a geosynchronous orbit, for instance, actually costs way more delta-v than sending a probe to the moon. Also, the amount of battery capacity required to keep 100% uptimes means a commsat in a geostationary orbit weighs a lot more than the MUN probe we just recovered. With better technology, unlocking bigger boosters and more far-reaching dishes will make us want to replace this network with something a bit more sophisticated. The final deployment of the satellites is done with the onboard reaction control systems, leaving no debris in orbit. They each end up in slightly erratic orbits, but with all satellites having the same semi-major axis, they'll remain evenly spaced around the planet. Of course, the in-game calculations are only so precise, and they will drift in relation to each other over the coming years. Also, I suspect I may have made a few erroneous calculations while setting up the network, which will become more evident as time goes on. But, this stopgap solution is only set to be in place for the time being, until we draft up a better one. We can pride ourselves in the fact that all six launches went wonderfully, and that our first more or less reliable remote text comms network is in place, dubbed L1 for layer 1 or something. Attentive viewers may have seen me upgrading the administration building earlier on during the episode. Those same viewers probably take me for an idiot, because the strategies provided in the stock game are, for lack of a better word, horrible. Of course, since they were so ridiculously overpowered in the first public release featuring them, it's understandable that a nerf was required. As such, no sane player would consider using any stock strategy under most normal circumstances, with the exchange rates being more or less abysmal. Then, along comes Strategia. This mod is great. This mod was also released about a week after I started this playthrough. However, I wouldn't let that stop me from installing the mod right away as I spotted it, 
having heard of a couple of months ago that something like this was in development and completely forgetting about it until it popped up as a near finished beta on the forums. What the mod does is to replace the stock strategies with more focus driven synergetic ones that can truly be considered strategies. It allows you to do things like pushing for a purely probe driven program, focus exclusively on exploring certain bodies at a time, hiring new talent at higher skill levels and discount prices, or simply handing out free ice cream. Accepting a strategy and then doing something entirely different in the game will often be penalized, making you actively consider which strategies you keep active. For instance, accepting Probe Frenzy 1 increases the cost of launching manned vessels by 100%, while increasing the amount of science returned from your probe missions. Played correctly, this is all good news. Played carelessly, you may empty your pockets in no time. For our own program, the decision is clear to us. We have already adopted the strategy of MUN probes. This gives us a 400% funds increase to our MUN milestone gains, while deducting 80% from the milestone gains from other bodies. This has pretty much already paid for itself in the one mission we've conducted, but we need to complete the objective of the program to land probes in three different biomes if we are to avoid the hefty penalty imposed on quitters. Had the mod been out earlier, we'd have liked to adopt the local science strategy as well. Sadly, this was not the case for this particular playthrough. Instead, having collected most of the science available to us in our vicinity, we look outwards with the strategy to boldly go, giving us a funds bonus of 15,000 space bucks upon science transmission from new biomes. This has only been briefly touching on the strategies available to you should you choose to install this mod. Down the road there are some very interesting synergies between different strategies to consider and we will come to change our focus throughout this playthrough as our demands and capabilities shift. In conclusion, even though there are still some bugs present even in the latest release of this mod, which isn't the same as the version featured on screen as a disclaimer, I give it a wholehearted recommendation to anyone playing career mode since it so effectively covers a very glaring blemish upon the stock game. Next time, in spite of our new probe focus, we'll see about getting a more Kerbal touch to space travel. I'll see you guys then.